This is the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter, 2020. Lesson 1 from the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide Making Friends for God, the Joy of Sharing in His Mission for June 27 to July 3, ready for teaching on July 4. This lesson is titled Why Witness and it's read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, June 27. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we open your word this week, as we open your word this quarter, as we learn how to share the love of Jesus with those around us, as we learn to share the story of his life, the story of what he's going to be doing now and what he's going to be doing in the future, we pray that our hearts may be opened, that your Holy Spirit will guide us, that your word may speak to us, and that each of us may be blessed as we work together and study together in reading your word, we pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Saviour, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4. Let's read that again. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Saviour, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4. Before reading the lesson for today, I think we ought to read the introduction to this quarter's lessons, because um, this quarter's lessons were written by Mark Finlay, who was a vice president of the General Conference of the Seventh-day Adventists from 2005 to 2010. He's a native of Connecticut in the United States and an internationally known evangelist. After retiring from full-time employment, he became an assistant to the president of the General Conference. Mark Finley and his wife, Ernestine, have three children and five grandchildren. He writes to begin this series of lessons. Making Friends for God, the Joy of Sharing in God's Mission There are times when grasping a single thought makes a profound difference in our lives. A number of years ago, I sat in a ministerial meeting with some of my colleagues. The discussion turned to sharing our faith, witnessing and evangelism. One of my friends expressed this thought. Mission is primarily the work of God. He is employing all of the resources of heaven to save our planet. Our work is to cooperate fully with him in his work of saving lost people. It seemed as if a heavy burden was lifted off my shoulders. It was not my job to save a lost world. It was God's. My responsibility was to cooperate with Him in what He was already doing. The idea that mission is God's work is clarified throughout Scripture. Solomon states it this way, He, that's God, has put eternity in their hearts. Ecclesiastes 3.11 when an individual is born into this world, God places a desire for eternity deep within the fabric of that person's being. As Augustine once said, Lord, we were made for Thee, and our hearts will never find rest until they find rest in Thee. According to John's Gospel, Jesus is the light that lights every person born into this world in John 1 verse 9. Not only has God placed within each one of us a longing for himself, but he also sends his Holy Spirit to draw us to himself. Every desire to do right and every conviction of sin is prompted by the Holy Spirit. Every desire for goodness and inclination toward kindness and unselfishness is motivated first by the Holy Spirit. Even though we may not fully understand or realize it, the Holy Spirit is working in our lives to draw us to Jesus. But Jesus himself is the greatest gift of all. When the human race was hopelessly lost in sin, condemned to eternal death, the love of God took the initiative. Luke writes, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost, in Luke 19 verse 10. 
The Apostle Paul adds, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5 verse 8 God took the initiative in our salvation. Christ left the glory and splendor of heaven and came to this sin-darkened world on a redemptive mission. Before we ever took one baby step toward him, he took a giant leap toward us. Before we ever gave him our life, he provided salvation to us through his death. We were his enemies, but he was our friend. We turned our backs on him, but he turned his face toward us. We cared little for him, but he cared immensely for us. In Luke 15, he is pictured as the good shepherd, relentlessly looking for his lost sheep, a woman frantically looking for her lost silver coin from her dowry, and an old father recklessly running to meet his lost boy. Ellen G. White makes this marvellous statement worth contemplating. The great plan of redemption was laid before the foundation of the world. Christ did not stand alone in this wondrous undertaking for the ransom of man. In the councils of heaven, before the world was created, the Father and the Son covenanted together that if man proved disloyal to God, Christ, one with the Father, would take the place of the transgressor and suffer the penalty of justice that must fall upon him. A quote from the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, November 15, 1898. Contemplate it for a moment. We have the incredible privilege and the awesome responsibility, as well as the eternal joy of participating with Christ and cooperating with Him in His mission. That's what these lessons are all about this quarter. And now back to Friday's lesson. God's great longing is for all people everywhere to respond to his love, accept his grace, be transformed by his spirit, and be saved into his kingdom. He has no greater desire than our salvation. His love is boundless. His mercy is measureless. His compassion is endless. His forgiveness is inexhaustible. His power is infinite. In contrast to the heathen gods, which demanded sacrifices, our God has made the supreme sacrifice. No matter how much we desire to be saved, God longs to save us more. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Saviour, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2 verses 3 and 4. His heart's longing is for your salvation and mine. Witnessing is all about Jesus. It is about what He has done to save us and about how He has changed our lives. It is about the marvellous truths of His Word which tell us about who He is and the beauty of His character. Why witness? When we understand who He is and have experienced the marvels of His grace and the power of his love, we cannot be silent. Why witness? While participating with him, we enter into his joy of seeing people redeemed by his grace and transformed by his love. Sunday, June 28. Providing Opportunities for Salvation God provides opportunities daily for people everywhere to know Him. He moves upon their hearts through His Holy Spirit. He reveals Himself in the beauty and complexity of the natural world. The vastness, order and symmetry of the universe speak of an infinite God with limitless wisdom and infinite power. He arranges circumstances or providences in our lives to draw us to Himself. Although God reveals Himself through the impressions of His Spirit, the glories of nature and the acts of providence, the clearest revelation of His love is found in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. When we share Jesus with others, we provide them with their best opportunity 
to be saved. Question. Read Luke chapter 19 and verse 10 and compare it with James 5, 19 and 20. What does Luke's gospel teach about Christ's purpose in coming to earth? How do we cooperate with Christ in his work of saving the lost? Luke 19 verse 10 For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And James 5, verses 19 and 20. Brethren, if any one among you wanders from the truth, and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. According to James, he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death. We just read that in James 5.20. The book of Romans amplifies this thought. In Romans 1 and 2, both the Gentiles who have seen God's revelation in nature and the Jews who have received God's prophetic revelation in Scripture are lost without Christ. In Romans 3 to 5, the Apostle reveals that salvation comes by grace through faith alone. In Romans 6 to 8, he describes how the grace that justifies each believer also is sanctifying grace. In Romans 10, he states that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, Romans 10, 13. And he then points out that none can call if they have not believed, and they cannot believe if they have not heard, and they cannot hear unless someone tells them. In Romans 10 verses 14 and 15. Let's read that. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. We are God's links in the plan of salvation to reach lost people with the glory of the gospel. And so to finish the day, we do not witness to give people their only chance to be saved. We witness to give them their best chance. What is our role in God's plan of redeeming the human race? Think about this too. How many people have heard the gospel from your own lips? Monday, June 29. Making Jesus Glad. Has anyone ever asked you, how is your day going? Or, is everything all right with you today? What if you asked God those questions? God, how is your day today? What kind of response do you think you would receive? Possibly it would be one like this. My day has been extremely difficult. Tears filled my eyes at 1,000 refugee camps filled with cold, hungry, crying children. I walked the streets of the world's crowded cities and wept with the homeless and destitute. My heart breaks over abused women and frightened children sold into sexual slavery. I witness the ravages of war, the devastating effects of natural disasters, and the painful agony of debilitating deadly diseases. Would you respond back by asking, But God, is there anything that makes you rejoice? Is there anything that brings joy to your heart? Is there anything that makes you sing? Question. Read Luke 15, verses 6, 7, 9, 10, 22 to 24, and 32. How do these stories end, and what do these endings tell you about God? Luke 15, Verse 6 and 7. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbours, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. 
I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. And beginning at verse 9, And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbours together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And verses 22 to 24, But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. And verse 32. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost, and is found. All heaven rejoices when the lost are found. In a world filled with disease, disaster, and death, we can bring joy to the heart of God by sharing the good news of salvation with others. One of the greatest motivations to share Christ's love is the knowledge that witnessing brings joy to the heart of God. Every time we reveal His love, All of heaven sings. Question, read Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 17. What is our Lord's response when we accept his saving grace? Zephaniah 3.17 The Lord your God in your midst, the Mighty One, will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Imagine this scene. As the result of your witness, some man or woman or boy or girl accept Jesus as his or her personal saviour. All of heaven bursts forth in rapturous song, and our mighty saviour rejoices over that individual with singing. What can be more rewarding, more fulfilling, than knowing your witness brings joy to the heart of God in a world of sadness? Tuesday, June 30. Growing by Giving. The Dead Sea marks the Earth's lowest elevation. At 1,388 feet below sea level, it ranks as the world's lowest sea. The River Jordan flows out of the Sea of Galilee and winds its way through the Jordan Valley until it dead ends in the Dead Sea. The hot, dry climate, with the intense sunlight and desert conditions, causes the water to evaporate quite rapidly. Since the Dead Sea's salt and mineral content is 33.7%, little survives in its waters. There are no fish, no plants, only some microbes and bacteria at the bottom. In our Christian lives, if the grace of God that flows into our lives does not flow out to others we will become stagnant and all but lifeless like the Dead Sea. As Christians, that's not how we are to live. Question. Read John chapter 7, verses 37 and 38, and Luke chapter 6, verse 38. When believers receive the refreshing streams of living water from Christ, what is the natural result? John 7, beginning at verse 37, On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And Luke six thirty-eight: Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be put into your bosom, for with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. 
God could have reached his object in saving sinners, Ellen White writes in The Desire of Ages, page 142, without our aid. But in order for us to develop a character like Christ's, we must share in his work. In order to enter into his joy, the joy of seeing souls redeemed by his sacrifice, we must participate in his labours for their redemption. And from the same author, Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 207, those who would be overcomers must be drawn out of themselves. And the only thing that will accomplish this great work is to become intensely interested in the salvation of others. End of quote. We grow as we share with others what Christ has done in our own lives. Considering all that we have been given in Christ, what but only the best abject selfishness could keep us from sharing with others what we have ourselves been given? If we fail to share our faith, our spiritual life will become as stagnant as the Dead Sea. And so to finish today, what have been your own experiences in witnessing to others, praying with others and ministering to the needs of others? How have these experiences impacted your own faith and walk with the Lord? Wednesday, July 1. Faithfulness to Christ's Command Loyalty to Christ requires a commitment to do His will. It necessitates obedience to His commands. It results in a heart that beats with His heart in saving the lost. It places priority on the things that He prioritises. Question. Read 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4, 2 Peter 3, Verse 9. What do these passages tell us about the heart of God? What is His priority? 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Saviour, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And 2 Peter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is passionate about saving people. There is nothing more important to Him. It is His earnest desire that all be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, as we read in verse 4 of First Timothy chapter 2. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3 verse 9. The Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary indicates that the Greek word used for willing in this passage is boulamai, B-O-U-L-O-M-A-I, which expresses the inclination of mind as to want or to desire. The commentary then makes this insightful observation on the little word but. The Greek word for but is ala, A-L-L-A. It is used here, as it says in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, volume 7, page 615, to emphasize the contrast between the misinterpretation of God's nature, namely that he might be willing for some to perish, and the truth that he wishes all to be saved. End of quote. Christ's command for each one of us to participate in his mission as witness of his love, grace and truth is an outgrowth of his desire for all humanity to be saved. Question. Read Acts chapter 13 verse 47 and compare it with Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 6. To whom did this passage initially apply? How does the Apostle Paul use it? Acts 13 verse 47 For so the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. 
And Isaiah 49 verse 6, Indeed, he says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. There are times when an Old Testament prophecy has more than one application. Here, the Apostle Paul takes a prophecy that referred first to Israel and prophetically to the Messiah. And we'll look up Isaiah 41 verse 8, Isaiah 49 verse 6 and Luke 2.32 and he applies it to the New Testament church. Let's read those texts. Isaiah 41 verse 8 But you, Israel, are my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend. Isaiah 49 verse 6, Indeed, he says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob, and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be my salvation, to the ends of the earth. And Luke 2.32, A light to bring revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. For the church to neglect or minimize the command of Christ is to fail in the purpose of her existence and miss her prophetic calling to the world. So to finish today, what are the dangers to the church, even a local church, if it becomes so inwardly focused that it forgets what its purpose is to begin with? Thursday, July 2. Motivated by love. This week we have focused on answering the question, why witness? We have discovered that as we share our faith, we have the joy of cooperating with God in His mission to the world. Our witness of His love provides people with greater opportunities for salvation since they can see more clearly His grace and truth. At the same time, witnessing also is one of God's means of helping us grow spiritually. A failure to share what Christ has done for us and to minister to others strangles genuine spiritual life. Witnessing places us in touch with the heart of the one who longs for all humanity to be saved. It is a response of obedience to his command. In today's study, we will examine the greatest motivation of all for witnessing. Question, read 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 and 15 and 18 to 20. What motivated Paul to experience trials and tribulations for the sake of the gospel? How can this same motivation prompt our service for Christ? 2 Corinthians 5 beginning at verse 14, For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died, and he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them, and rose again. And verse verse 18, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to the world." The Apostle Paul was motivated by love. There are things you will do for love that you will do for no other reason. When the Apostle declares the love of Christ constrains us, he is speaking an eternal truth. The word constrains means to urge, to impel, to control, or to highly motivate. Thus, the love of Christ controlled Paul's actions and motivated his witness. 
with undaunted purpose and singleness of mind, he shared the plan of salvation throughout the Mediterranean world. In the Adventist home, page 428, Ellen White writes, Love must dwell in the heart. A thoroughgoing Christian draws his motives of action from his deep heart love for his master. Up through the roots of his affection for Christ springs an unselfish interest in his brethren. End of quote. When we truly recognize the immense sacrifice Christ has made for us, we are overwhelmed by his love and compelled to share with others what he has done for us. And so to finish the day. The one who created our creation, the galaxies, the stars, the angelic host, the entire cosmos and other worlds, was the one who died on the cross for us. How can this astonishing truth not create in us a love for God and a desire to share that love? Friday, July 3. The New Testament Church faced the danger of failing to understand the purpose of its existence. Ellen G. White describes this danger in the Acts of the Apostles, page 105. The persecution that came upon the church in Jerusalem resulted in giving a great impetus to the work of the gospel. Success had attended the ministry of the word in that place, and there was danger that the disciples would linger there too long, unmindful of the Saviour's commission to go to all the world. Forgetting that strength to resist evil is best gained by aggressive service, they began to think that they had no work so important as that of shielding the church in Jerusalem from the attacks of the enemy. Instead of educating the new converts to carry the gospel to those who had not heard it, they were in danger of taking a course that would lead all to be satisfied with what had been accomplished. End of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. 1. Look carefully at the Ellen White quote above, especially the last line. Why must we even today, be careful of that same potential danger. In the face of the missionary challenges before us, why would such an attitude be so terribly, even tragically wrong? 2. Why do you think each of the Gospels ends with a similar command? What did this mean to these first century believers, and what should it mean to us today? Matthew 28, verses 18 to twenty, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And Luke 24, verses 46 to 49. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem." And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And John 20, verse 21. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. 3. Can witnessing and service ever become a substitute for genuine spirituality? If so, how? And how can we be careful of that trap? 4. In class, talk about the answer to the question at the end of Tuesday's study, regarding how witnessing and ministering impact your own spiritual growth. 
What are some things you have learned that can help others? What mistakes have you made that you could help others avoid? And there is a fifth question. Dwell on the amazing fact that God loves each one of us individually. How do you understand what this means? How should this perhaps the most important truth in all the universe impact how you live? Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Stopped at the Airport and it's by Glenn Ernford Lay. Only one question will be asked on Judgment Day. I heard it when my international flight landed in Portland in the United States state of Oregon. The US immigration officer glanced at my Norwegian passport and then looked up at me at Portland International Airport. What are your plans? he asked. I am visiting a friend, I replied. What is the address? he said. I don't know, I said. But she is going to meet me here at the airport. The immigration officer didn't look pleased that I didn't know the address. So, where did you meet her? he said. At a college outside London. What did you study there? Theology. The immigration officer studied my face. Are you a believer? he said. Yes. He looked down at my passport in his hand and then back at me. So, why are you saved? he said. The answer tumbled out of my mouth. Because Jesus died for me, I said. The immigration officer looked at me. Good answer, he said. You may enter. I smiled and entered the United States. The significance of the conversation struck me as I walked to the baggage claim area. Only one question will be asked on Judgment Day. Why are you saved? The answer is found in 1 John 5, to 13 which says, And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Why are you saved? With the assurance of salvation, you can reply with confidence, because Jesus died for me. In return, you will hear the sweet words. Good answer. You may enter. Glenn Enford Lye, age 55, is a teacher at Osmarka Seventh-day Adventist School in Oslo, Norway, and a member and former youth pastor of Bethel Seventh-day Adventist Church, which received part of the 2017 13th Sabbath offering to open a youth community centre. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind and Hearing Impaired, Christian Record Services for the Blind, the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel. You can also listen on the official Sabbath School 4 app and the Apple iTunes app, Sabbath School with Percy Harold. Remember, God is always faithful.